much has been happening in politics and indeed in the news media and in our country since the change of government. And there is a new broom sweeping through and in some cases sweeping away. But the resistance to the election result from our news media and from many in the public service is obvious for all to see. Um, and when we look at the Hurricanes, uh, Chicks Hurricanes team's um, offensive, politically offensive um, haka, that is the mood, particularly in Wellington, of many people. What can a new government do about this? And how does a new government change the culture of debate in this country and try and remove some of the extremism and polarisation that exists? Well, to talk about this and a few other specific issues, we are joined now by the leader of the ACT Party, by video, I think, uh, David Seymour and the Minister of Regulation. David, nice to have you back with us. Boy, you've been making some headlines and getting some coverage in X lately, haven't you? I wouldn't know, uh, Sean. Um, I, my advice to anyone who wants to live a happy life is not to go on there. All right. Well, look, first I want to deal with a couple of current issues. We've got an interview with management of the Hurricanes later this morning. They basically are walking away from a haka or a woman's pua or whatever they wanted to call it that said that people that supported this government were redneck white supremacists. You must be heartened that the franchise has seen sense over this? Well, um, see, my dad's family is from the Manawatu and I grew up uh, cheering on Christian Cullen, so I'm actually a, a Hurricane supporter. I Did hope I? that doesn't yeah. lose me any support. Um, so, you know, I mean, uh, it's a real shame that the real issue here is that the, the Hurricanes poor, or the Hurricanes women's team, finished bottom of the table uh, last year um, and they appear to be bottom of the table for, so far this season. Now, if they just focused a little bit more on practising their moves and uh, less on their haka and their politics, I, I think they could potentially win some games and that would be the best outcome for all of us. All right. Um, but they were basically calling not just ACT, but anyone who supported the government white supremacists. That's pretty extreme rhetoric in the New Zealand context, is it, or is it now becoming the norm? Well, you'd, you'd hope not. I mean, you know, in, in all fairness, um, you know, we, we criticise the media uh, for various things, but you know, it was the lead story on One News last night. So they did actually get some attention for this, and it sounds like the management are backing away from it partly as a result Listen of Listen to our interview and, later today, uh, Marty's that, interview, that, at a that, rate that, of knots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and that can only be a good thing. Um, but it does raise the wider question. I mean, you also got this Joanne Kidman person who... Yeah, um, I want to get on this. So Joanne Kidman, we covered this at the time. Yeah. We looked at Joanne Kidman. Jacinda Ardern points here to a anti-extremism kind of, I don't know, sinecure inside the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. We're also we're dwelling um, the disinformation project, the Kate Hannans, the Sanjar Hatatawas of the world. Um, she, we looked at some of the statements she'd made, some of the academic writings she'd been involved in, and that to say they were radical would be an understatement. Uh, what is it that Joanna Kidman, who is pulling the taxpayer's dollar at the moment, what are the sort of things that she's taken that you think make her unfit to hold her position? Well, I mean, uh, uh, as far as I understand it, First of all, she's, she's funded by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and um, uh, she's practising out of the um, Victoria University. Uh, so, you know, she said that, we're, what did she say, the government's a death cult because she doesn't like some of our policies. Well, you know, she wants to legitimately debate our policies and it's not clear um, why the Centre for Extremism should be doing that. How can um, someone who I runs the Centre for folks. Extremism call the government a death cult? Well, <laughs> you know, to be honest, Sean, a, a lot of this, just I just laugh. I mean, I, I suspect what's going to happen is that as the government uh, really struggles to put together a budget in you know, quite challenging circumstances, um, it may be a bit of a challenge to ask, you know, are these guys adding value? 
Um, but for the most part, you just have to laugh at them. I mean, supposedly they're there to well, stop. Well, but the I'm paying. For, I'm sorry. We're all paying for this. Shouldn't Chris Luxon go through the expenditure of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, which I'm full is full of sinecures for the last government's mates, and swing the axe? Well, that, that's exactly my point. I mean, maybe I'm making it a bit subtly, but um, as we put together a budget, I think some of these people may find that, um, you know, we can only afford to do so many things that really matter to the average person, and um, they've ruled themselves out of that. Well, have you talked to Luxon about doing this? I mean, is he well, aware of the to... people of, of, of I'm going to say, the, the fifth columnist that have been installed inside his particular bureaucracy? Well, in, in all fairness, Chris has been um, in Sydney for, well, or Australia at least, for the last uh, 24 hours or so. It was, it was good to see he finally got away um, after, after the plane fiasco. And, and, and yes, I mean, I'm sure there'll be a discussion about this either later in the week or the start of next week when we uh, meet again for Cabinet. Uh, OK, so you're saying defund the radicals? Well, I, I could tell you we're, we're going to have to defund a lot of stuff. I mean, we're making hard choices. You know, part of the reason that uh, people have been having a go at me over the last few days is I've, I've been delegated the job of making sense of the free school lunch program. Well, uh, not we free school lunch, taxpayer-funded school lunch program. Let, let, let's get our terminology right because nothing's free in this life. Well, there's, as Milton Friedman said, there's no such thing as a free, free lunch. lunch. It is yeah. taxpayer funded and free at the point of consumption. Um, and you know, I, take, I take your point, but that's what that's what it's usually regarded as. And uh, you know, I'm having to find ways to save money on that. Uh, I think other people that are adding no value whatsoever uh, are going to find it really challenging to continue after this budget. Yeah. Look, and there's been a lot of focus on that, and I'm sorry, it's a pretty, it's a pretty convenient and comfortable stick to pick up for the left to pick up and beat the right with, because it's kids and it's free school lunches. Do you envisage getting sure, rid of them completely, or do you envisage having a delivery mechanism and a targeting me mechanism that is more efficient, more focused, and better value for money than we've got now? Um, the, the latter. I mean, they, they, there will continue to be some sort of taxpayer-funded food and schools program. Right. Uh, and the reason for is that there, there's, there's some kids who are in great need, and we think it can make a difference for some of them. But just taking 25% of schools, actually now over 27% of all schools, and saying we're going to give a lunch to every single kid, um, that, in my view is not the best way to do it and we're going to find a, a much better way but we're, we're literally working through those details right now and I'm, I'm looking forward to announcing them as soon as we got the cabinet signed off and all the rest.